gotta catch the early light I'm going fishing for a feeling I get when the fish bite Oh, I gotta say my prayers and go down the covers and kiss my wife goodnight I'm going fishing in the morning, gotta catch the early light Early in the morning, it gets me from my sleep. Forefinger of my uh, right hand in this case because I'm a right handed caster. Just feel you get a better uh, sensitivity, and I'm just going to slowly bring the fly in and choose a pace that matches the food source you're imitating. So for coronamids, it's going to be extremely slow. If I was perhaps imitating a damsel, I might be a little faster. I could be a scud, I could go fast for a second, pause, strip, fast, pull, and mix and match this to imitate whatever food source you've got on the end of your line. The other method we can do as well is simply place the line under the forefinger and just strip it. We can do long, slow pulls. Place the pause in there and see if we have any response. We can do what I call the four to six inch pulls, or we can do short choppy variations, or even for coronamids, if you struggle with the hand twist, is just pinch the line, just like this. I'm moving it in about one half to three quarters of an inch, and I'm just pinching it along ever so slowly like this. This retrieve for coronamids takes a bit of discipline because it's quite uh, common and easy to go a little faster, go a little faster, and pretty soon you've got uh, a warp sc speed coronamid, which is uh, not too effective. So you want to keep things, most retrieves in still waters that I can think of, it's better air on the side of slow and methodical uh, with pauses here and there uh, than anything fast and steady. So again, those are the, the retrieves you've got to do because in still waters, your hands do all the movement of the fly. You don't have any current per se like you do in a river or stream anyway to move the fly uh, through the water column or help get that fly to come to life. What I'm doing here, Jack, is just a technique known as wind drifting. I'm just, uh, actually, it's almost like fishing a river. You can see I'm throwing little men's and I'm allowing, I'm just watching that indicator and allowing that uh, fly to sweep through the water column. I'm fishing two coronamid pupa here, two varying sizes and colors to cover all my options and I'm just allowing the wind to sweep that fly through the water column. Very very slow retrieve. I'm just taking contact. I'm not even really pulling on the fly at all. Um, if you like you can give the fly the odd sort of 6 to 12 inch pull, make that indicator move. What that does is pitches those coronamids up and as you release your retrieve they kind of flutter back down again to, and it does a great job of suggesting the rise fall rise fall motion of an emerging coronamid pupa. They're still rising Phil you need to get them. I know. You know what we left? All our flies in the boat. Yeah I think we could use some uh, lunches. Some of those crazy rubber leg patterns of yours that might... Well I'm uh, going to run back and get the boat while okay. you teach our friends some of the other techniques from the shore. I'd be happy to, Jack. How's that? Hurry back. <laughs> All right, don't worry. I'll hurry back with the lunch and the flies. But I, you know, the old story though. I got to do this. I got to do one more cast. Look at that. I keep rising over the yeah. place. What do you think they're rising for? Well, there could be a number of candidates. First of all, we we do see the odd coronamid flying around, so it could be egg-laying females um, or um, pupa as they're right in the moment of transition, emergers and adults. And also we've got the uh, grasslands uh, behind us and to our left here and all, basically all around us. There's all kinds of insects, terrestrials that could be swept under the water. Ants, beetles, um, even potentially hoppers. It's been uh, unusually warm so far this year.
You know what I think we need to do? We ought to ask Brian what he thinks. Yeah, I'd certainly take any advice I could get. <laughs> Let's go to Brian. Well, we've all been in that situation, guys, and I think you ought to watch closely at what the other angler is doing in terms of, in that situation, you're fishing strike indicators, so it could be depth. It could be a difference of a six inches in depth. He was six inches higher or lower than what you two were fishing, and that can make all the difference in the world. <laughs> well, I don't think I can get a rainbow at home like this on the Snake River <laughs> or, the, or the New Fork or any of the other rivers. Well, I don't think I can get a rainbow at home like this on the Snake River <laughs> or, the, or the New Fork or any of the other rivers. What I'd like to show you now is my personal selection of flies, as a, and you can use these as a guide for your own fly selection. The first box I have here is full of coronamids, arguably the most important food source in still waters. What I have here is a full selection of coronamid larval patterns, often referred to as bloodworms. I have coronamid pupa patterns in a wide range of sizes and colors. Your size ranges are going to be probably from number 18, uh, depending on some of the lakes you fish, all the way up to as large as 8, 2, or 3 extra long for those big bomber hatches that we uh, often refer to, those large coronamids. So good cross-section, browns, blacks, greens, uh, micromies with the silver bodies are a good starting point, contrasting ribs, uh, red ribs, copper, gold, silver, uh, a whole variety of sizes and colors. You can really go wild and fill a number of boxes with coronavid patterns. The next box I have feature scud patterns. Again, another critical food source on still waters. Here we have uh, a wide ranges. You'll see olive is a very popular color, some with more mobile materials to help suggest life. Uh, size ranges again, probably uh, 16 uh, up through 10, and a number 12 scud pattern in olive would be a good all-around color. It's all right to have a little bit of sparkle and bling, if you like, to your flies to help uh, draw a rainbow over for a look. On this side, uh, a bit more of a focused uh, opportunity, but I have a good selection of water boatmen and back swimmer patterns. Um, these generally occur in early spring and late fall, uh, but that can vary on uh, regions and lakes but it's always handy to have a size range from probably a number 10 down through 14 or even 16. And uh, again, although they're localized, can be some very exciting fishing as fish come up on the surface and take these insects as they return from their mating and egg laying flights. The next box I have contains a lot of my nymphs, damsels and mayfly nymphs and caddis. Um, although mayflies aren't as prevalent as they are on rivers and streams, the calabatus hatch common to Western North America is a very popular hatch to fish and when calabatus do occur they're very uh, uh, can be very prolific so we want to have a good selection of uh, nymph patterns um, beadhead pheasant tails skip nymphs uh, my own hurl maze and turkey quill calabatus um, are all excellent patterns over here we have just some general impressionistic nymphs halfbacks fullbacks a little welsh pattern known as the deal bach uh, tr little literal translation, the little devil. So just impressionistic nymphs that can be used to suggest a host of different food items. Great fly to cover water with and find active fish. Hare's ear nymphs are a great still water fly as well and so are prince nymphs. Hare's ears can be used to suggest scuds and mayflies for example. Prince nymphs can be also a great uh, suggestion of a water boatman or a back swimmer with those prominent white goose biots. Over on the other side here I have a selection of caddis pupa patterns uh, ranging in um, from very small 14s and 16s all the way up to large number 8s and number 6s for those large traveling sedge emergences. Uh, these are an exciting fly to fish and a great way to extend the hatch uh, by fishing pupil patterns. My next box contains the big uglies. I'll just turn it around so you can see it a little better. Um, we've got all of my leech and bait fish patterns here. Some of them are falling out of their places. This, fl this fly box gets a lot of use. You can see a lot of different colors, uh, blacks, maroons, purples, browns, olives. My bait fish imitations up here, again featuring the same pattern colorations. These are large mobile flies um, designed to elicit a strong response from the trout, a great evening pattern when trout come into the, the uh, shallows and forage, and a great start the day pattern when you're not sure what the food source might be. You can cover water and find active fish and through careful use of your throat pump, you can then perhaps dial your presentation down. In my leech boxes, 
uh, generally it's probably a size is uh, 10 through 6 is a good starting point although don't be afraid of tying some really small leeches in as small as even 12 or 14 we call them micro leeches and they're great to hang under an indicator in the shallow water especially in early spring and late fall don't leave home without your leeches and bait fish patterns okay my last box here i'll show you as the sign says are my dragonfly nymphs these are your big ticket items um, the dragonfly nymphs many species have prolonged nymphal cycles and can be in the water up to four years and this is a food source trout are accustomed to and generally respond well uh, to anything presented in front of their nose uh, you can see the large patterns uh, good overall size uh, for the larger crawling nymphs the darners we often refer to them is a number six but i would carry a range of number 10 through number six and i even know some of my friends like a large number four again these are large bulky patterns uh, featuring rubber legs uh, mobile materials such as aftershaft or rabbit fur for the bodies this is just a big morsel uh, that we're offering to the trout you can also have some of these smaller sprawler nymphs uh, that are more sedentary in nature they tend to lie in ambush uh, they're squat and spider like and we use a lot of buoyant materials throughout our dragon designs because to fish your dragons pro properly you've got to put them in the weedy areas and we want flies that are going to foul and be easy to use in those areas so buoyancy is a key again we use fast sinking lines with these to drag them down and let the fly creep across uh, creep across the bottom uh, substrate and uh, weeds so a good selection of dragonflies you can also bring your river and stream dry flies along uh, elk hair caddis um, your atoms your parachute patterns your terrestrials your chernobyl ants those all have a place in still waters most of the still water fly fishing is going to be subsurface uh, but you need to have uh, some dries and emergers on hand for those times when they do come up on the surface and feed. So there you go, a quick cross section. Again, you can fill as many fly boxes as you can buy, and that's part of the fun and allure of fly fishing, and especially true in still waters. What I'd like to show you now is my personal selection of flies, as a, and you can use these as a guide for your own fly selection. The first box I have here is full of coronamids, arguably the most important food source in still waters. What I have here is a full selection of coronamid larval patterns, often referred to as bloodworms. I have coronamid pupa patterns in a wide range of sizes and colors. Your size ranges are going to be probably from number 18, uh, depending on some of the lakes you fish, all the way up to as large as 8, 2, or 3 extra long for those big bomber hatches that we uh, often refer to as large coronamids. So a good cross-section, browns, blacks, greens, uh, micromies with the silver bodies, are a good starting point. Contrasting ribs, uh, red ribs, copper, gold, silver, uh, a whole variety of sizes and colors. You can really go wild and fill a number of boxes with coronamid patterns. The next box I have feature scud patterns. Again, another critical food source on still waters. Here we have uh, a wide ranges. You'll see olive is a very popular color some with more mobile materials to help suggest life. Uh, size ranges again, probably uh, 16 uh, up through 10, and a number 12 scud pattern in olive would be a good all-around color. It's all right to have a little bit of sparkle and bling, if you like, to your flies to help uh, draw a rainbow over for a look. On this side, uh, a bit more of a focused uh, opportunity, but I have a good selection of water boatmen and back swimmer patterns. Um, these generally occur in early spring and late fall, uh, but that can vary on uh, regions and lakes, but it's always handy to have a size range from probably a number 10 down through 14 or even 16. And uh, again, although they're localized, can be some very exciting fishing as fish come up on the surface and take these insects as they return from their mating and egg laying flights. The next box I have contains a lot of my nymphs, damsels and mayfly nymphs and caddis. Um, although mayflies aren't as prevalent as they are on rivers and streams, the calabatus hatch common to western North America is a very popular hatch to fish and when calabatus do occur, they uh, uh, can be very prolific, so we want to have a good selection of uh, nymph patterns, um, beadhead pheasant tails, skip nymphs, uh, my own hurl maze and turkey quill calabatus um, are all excellent patterns. Over here we have just some general impressionistic nymphs halfbacks, fullbacks, a little Welsh pattern known as the Dial Bach, 
uh, little literal translation, the little devil. So just impressionistic nymphs that can be used to suggest a host of different food items. Great fly to cover water with and find active fish. Hare's ear nymphs are a great still water fly as well, and so are prince nymphs. Hare's ears can be used to suggest scuds and mayflies, for example. Prince nymphs can be also a great uh, suggestion of a water boatman or a back swimmer with those prominent white goose biots. Over on the other side here, I have a selection of caddis pupa patterns, uh, ranging in, um, from very small 14s and 16s, all the way up to large number 8s and number 6s for those large traveling sedge emergences. Uh, these are an exciting fly to fish and a great way to extend the hatch uh, by fishing pupil patterns. My next box contains the big uglies. I'll just turn it around so you can see it a little better. Um, we've got all of my leech and bait fish patterns here. Some of them are falling out of their places. This, fl this fly box gets a lot of use. You can see a lot of different colors. Uh, blacks, maroons, purples, browns, olives. My bait fish imitations up here, again featuring the same pattern colorations. These are large mobile flies um, designed to elicit a strong response from the trout, a great evening pattern when trout come into the, the uh, shallows and forage, and a great start the day pattern when you're not sure what the food source might be. You can cover water and find active fish, and through careful use of your throat pump, you can then perhaps dial your presentation down. In my leech boxes, uh, generally as probably a size is uh, 10 through 6 is a good starting point, although don't be afraid of tying some really small leeches in as small as even 12 or 14. We call them micro leeches and they're great to hang under an indicator in the shallow water, especially in early spring and late fall. Don't leave home without your leeches and bait fish patterns. Okay, my last box here I'll show you, as the sign says, are my dragonfly nymphs. These are your big ticket items. Um, the dragonfly nymphs, many species have prolonged nymphal cycles and can be in the water up to four years and this is a food source trout are accustomed to and generally respond well uh, to anything presented in front of their nose. Uh, you can see the large patterns, uh, good overall size uh, for the larger crawling nymphs, the darners we often refer to them is a number six, but I would carry a range of number 10 through number six and I even know some of my friends like a large number four. Again, these are large bulky patterns uh, featuring rubber legs, uh, mobile materials such as aftershaft or rabbit fur for the bodies. This is just a big morsel uh, that we're offering to the trout. You can also have some of these smaller sprawler nymphs uh, that are more sedentary in nature. They tend to lie in ambush. Uh, they're squat and spider-like and we use a lot of buoyant materials throughout our dragon designs because to fish your dragons properly you've got to put them in the weedy areas and we want flies that are going to foul and be easy to use in those areas. So buoyancy is a key. Again, we use fast sinking lines with these to drag them down and let the fly creep, acro uh, creep across the bottom uh, substrate and uh, weeds. So a good selection of dragonflies. You can also bring your river and stream dry flies along, uh, elk hair caddis, um, your atoms, your parachute patterns, your terrestrials, your Chernobyl ants. Those all have a place in still waters. Most of the still water fly fishing is going to be subsurface. Uh, but you need to have uh, some dries and emergers on hand for those times when they do come up on the surface and feed. So there you go, a quick cross section. Again, you can fill as many fly boxes as you can buy, and that's part of the fun and the lure of fly fishing, and especially true in still waters. Starting to get into the mid-afternoon, warming up. Uh, it's dragonfly time. If this was uh, probably a hot August day, we'd be definitely looking at the dragonflies. But you know, the, dragon, the, the dragonfly nymphs are always in the water. Yes, they are, Jack. And you, you told me that, by God, this fly could work right now. Mm -hmm. But tell us a little bit about the uh, uh, fishing these, these dragonflies and a little bit of why you tie it the way you do. Well, I pretty well tie all of my dragonfly patterns the same basic philosophy, and that's one focused around buoyancy. And what we've got here is a uh, grizzly dragon uh, it's had a dunking already, and you can see um, before, when the fly is dry, it looks like a bit like a feather duster. But once it gets wet, all the uh, marabou lies down, and this fly has a buoyant core with a foam underbody and foam eyes, uh, borrowed from an, an English pattern called the booby. And the idea of this, I'm fishing this fly on a fast sinking type 6 fly line with a very short leader. I've probably got four or five feet of leader. That's it. And the concept being that the fly line pulls this fly, literally drags it under the surface, 
and the fly line is actually lying along the bottom and I'm just creepy crawling and inching this fly along and because it's buoyant in nature it's going to resist hanging up on the bottom and fish can come up behind it and, and take it in. And takes to this are usually pretty solid. So what we're doing here is I've cast the fly line out and I'm just right now I'm using a variety of retrieves, a steady hand twist to imitate a nymph that's just out and about looking for food. They're very predatory in nature so I'm just imitating the fly as it's crawling over the bottom. I can add a few quick strips to draw attention to the fly and then let it sit and dragonflies have the ability to shoot water um, out of their their uh, abdomens out the backside and they can jet along in four to six inch bursts and they use this to escape uh, potential predators such as trout or other larger dragonfly nymphs and also as a last sort of bull rush when they uh, attack whatever prey they've got in mind and they can eat and tackle they'll eat small minnows uh, each other, damselflies, mayflies, coronamid larvae, pupa if there's one hanging near the bottom, they're just voracious. Brown. In other words, they're very crude insects. It's yeah. exciting to see fish moving on a lake. I, I think that's uh, one of the things a lot of anglers miss when they say, ah, I don't want to go to the lake because it's always dripping flies in. And when they're close to the surface, it's going to be, it's like fishing a spring creek. Yeah, it's very exciting. Well, there All you right. go, Jack. Proof in the pudding. Well, it's about time. Getting my fly out of the way. This looks pretty neat. Yeah, he's nice and silver bright, and he's yep. somewhat upset with what's going on right now. So yeah, this is what I like about. So you have to have the patience to slow your retrieves down. There's no point in doing 12 to 20 inch fast strips when you're trying to imitate a chronomid pupa. That's not how they swim and you're going to be unsuccessful. So you need patience. Secondly, when you're fishing out of a boat or even out of a pontoon boat, you want to make sure you have complete control over your retrieves. That means double anchoring, a bow out, an anchor out the bow, an anchor out the stern. That way, the, when the wind shifts direction, your boat's not going to move and you're going to maintain control of your retrieves. Third, a very common mistake we see is that even before you get out on the water, take 30 seconds to a minute to straighten out your monofilament leader. Get the coil, get the memory out of the butt section of your leader so that when you lay a, a cast down, you've got a straight line connection between your fly rod, your fly line, your leader, and your fly. It's very frustrating to be fishing with a slinky or a number of coils in your leader because you're gonna get a strike and not even detect it. And fourth, when we're actually doing the fishing situations on the lake, it's much more efficient to be holding your rod tip down on the water. Your rod tip should be within six inches or right in the surface film of the lake, not held up on a 45 degree angle. If you do that, you're going to have a belly in your line and you're going to miss a strike. Again, we want to have a straight line connection as possible between your fly rod, your fly line, your leader and your fly. So keep the tip of your rod right on the water. If you just thought about those four tips there, it would immensely improve your success rate on any waters you plan to fish. Today on the lake, the water, surface water temperature is 62.5 degrees Fahrenheit, which is, a, which is right in the ideal zone for aquatic insects to be emerging, and that's why we're seeing some pretty heavy acronymate emergences. That temperature range between 50 degrees Fahrenheit and about 67, 68 degrees Fahrenheit means there'll be a lot of invertebrate activity, which would include leeches, which would include damselfly nymphs, dragonfly nymphs, uh, mayfly nymphs, and all those different species of insects uh, were, are also going to emerge according to the water temperature. And the way it usually works, the way it always works, is the chronomids or midges hatch first, and then they're often followed typically by mayflies, which are followed by the damselflies, and then the dragonflies, and then between damsels and dragons or sometimes at the same time, you'll see the caddis. And then finally in the fall, uh, you'll see a lot more water boatmen 
activity, but that's not more related to water temperature. That's because they're doing their fall swarming and uh, mating flights. Barometric pressure is one of those discussion points that there's many diverse opinions on how it affects fish and their activity levels. I think it's safe to say that when you have stable or rising barometer, that means the weather is going to be stable. And if you look at animals in general, like wildlife, they're much more active when the barometric pressure is stable or rising. Similarly, in the aquatic environment, when you have a stable or rising barometer, things are pretty good. Insects are hatching, the fish are generally happy. What happens when the barometric pressure declines rapidly, that it, it tells us that there's a storm coming in. And there could be some issues with barometric pressure, barometric pressure affecting subsurface or aquatic um, insect and fish life. I guess it's safe to say that when the barometer is falling or crashing, oftentimes the fishing is poor. And again, there's many variables why that's happening, but that's pretty well a statement of fact and something we have to live with as anglers. Water temperature is, is a key environmental factor that any fly fisher needs to understand. Water temperature dictates oxygen levels in the water. The cooler the water, the more oxygen it's going to support. Also, water temperature dictates when insects emerge. It's all based on water temperature. And so a good, good temperature for most situations to consider is that if the surface temperature of a lake is around 50 degrees Fahrenheit, you know the water's warm enough for major insect emergencies to occur. Conversely, in the mid or warm parts of the summer, when the surface temperatures of the lake reach in excess of 70 degrees Fahrenheit, you know that their fish are going to be uncomfortable because there's going to be a lot less oxygen in the water. And those, and those warm days when the water gets that warm, that's when the angler really has to consider if you're fishing and you're catching fish, you want to play them quickly, get them into the net, release them as soon as you can because you don't want to put them into any more stress than they already are in when trying to live or survive in that warmer water. Well, Jack's fishing with a clear intermediate and a couple of patterns. He's got a small scud pattern on and a leech pattern. And one of the important tricks you can learn when fly fishing still waters is uh, counting the fly line or the, and the flies down. And what that means is Jack has simply made his cast and he's going to count to a preset figure he's uh, determined based on the depth that we're fishing. We're about nine feet here and the known sink rate of the fly line. Typically the clear intermediates, depending on the manufacturer, sink from an inch and a half to two inches per second. So he's just going to cast that line out, maybe let it sink 20 counts. You can use the sweep hand of your watch as a great uh, technique as well, and then start your retrieve. If he doesn't get any, if he doesn't touch bottom, or he doesn't get a, a uh, take, he, on his next cast, he may let it sink 25 seconds, and he may touch bottom. So he may want to let it only sink 23 seconds. What he's doing is systematically eliminating um, non-productive water and trying to get that fly and fly line traveling through the same consistent zone throughout his retrieve. And that's the key to being successful on still waters, is finding that depth the fish are holding at and consistently placing the fly there. One of the things I do with a sinking line, no matter whether it's a, a full sinker, or a type six, four, whatever, is that I stick my rod right straight down in the water. That'll help the sink rate. And, and I count by 21, 22, 23, you know, I'll pick like, you know, 60 or whatever I want to be. But it's just about the second, 21, 22, 23. And, uh, and then just work my way, go all the way deep, work my way up. Also, when I come back, I, I uh, change my strips. I'll maybe go a little fast at first, drop, then just try all different patterns of, of stripping. When I'm fishing, uh, uh, these leeches and streamer type patterns on the bottom. Uh, I start fast first, and if that, and if I don't get anything, then I slow it down, and I and I do at least three or two to three casts per depth with different retrieves. So not only have I covered the depth, 
but I've also covered uh, the types of retrieves. And, I, and I've done it, in, maybe it'll only be two or three, uh, but I try it within the same strip, and I try to remember what strip really took the fish. And I can tell you from today, the strip that I was taking the fish on was one long, two shorts, one long, two short. Oz, one long, two strip, just had a strike then. And, uh, you know, just kind of get a little bit of rhythm. I, I do notice that something different than in a, in a river is in a lake, when I strip the leeches and streamers, I like to little like the pauses, and I don't do that when I fish in a, in a stream because the, the fish are usually trying to get away from something chasing it. Here, they're just minding their business, aren't they? Yeah, we're just trying to imitate a leech that's moving from point A to point B. Yeah. multiple fly rigs to A, search out which pattern is working, which size may be working, and fish different depths to find out what uh, zone the fish are in. For that okay, day. now I've set up, uh, as per your instructions, with the strike indicator. Yeah, it's a great way and to I'm, suspend I'm bringing it, it in, and, and uh, you recommended it to start out with about five feet underneath? Yeah, you want to hang the flies depending on the bottom cover, and we've got weeds in here, so you're casting into about seven, eight feet. So you're about one to two feet off the bottom so the fish can find that fly suspending. And in this uh, wind we've got here, it's much like fishing a river. You reach casts and mends and just allow that fly to sweep right along the shoreline. And uh, you can fish it dead drift or every once in a while you can give it a little six to 12 inch pull. Now pitch those coronamids up and let them sit down and let them drift. It kind of lets your fly stand out in the crowd a little bit. A uh, smooth strip or a little fast? No, you can just one slow pull and then just let it sit. Okay. Because quite often the take will come right after you've made that strip. I noticed you weren't making really long casts from uh, uh, when I was watching you fish this from the shore yesterday. No, with indicators, because your your fly is is hanging through 90 degrees, fl floating line going this way, and then your your fly hanging straight down. You want to keep your indicators close to you so when that fish pulls it under, you can simply get to it faster. You right. got too far away. You got to pull up a you lot. You pull up a lot of line and he'll spit it out. I think I got the weed. Uh, Whoa! <laughs> I, I thought I had Great. the weed. <laughs> well, he's coming in, but I got a lot of line here. I think he's going to about to take some line. Oh, that one's got some shoulders. 
Yeah, he does. <laughs> that's what I came to Canada for. Yeah. Well, you know, whoa, that's what we like. Whoa, whoa that's a... <laughs> he hasn't missed...